Hello and welcome to the introduction of day three of the NeuroMatch Academy. I'm Jan Drugovic and I'm an assistant professor of neurobiology at the Harvard Medical School. My lab works in computational neuroscience, in particular in asking how the brain implements Bayesian computations, as well as decision making more generally. To give you an overview, during day one, we've seen that there are different kinds of useful models and that they all have parameters. During the day two, we saw how we come up with models and we've manually selected parameters that seem to work, and we've compared the R squared of two alternative models to see which one is better. Today, on the third day, we will learn about how to choose the best parameters by model fitting, and how to properly evaluate how good a model is with respect to data and with respect to other models. So arguably, there are two central questions in science. The first is that models have free parameters such that we have to ask how to choose these parameters. Furthermore, how do we understand how uncertain we are about these parameters? The second is that we have multiple models and we want to ask which explains reality better. Arguably, almost all of neuroscience is about finding good models, as you may remember from day one. Finding good models isn't only about how well they describe the data, but how well they do is a very important component. In this introduction, I want to first look in more detail at the purpose of model fitting, and then introduce a special kind of model known as linear models, which will be the focus of uh, attention of this day. In the second part, we'll be looking at model fitting by minimizing errors or by maximizing likelihoods. Furthermore, we will look at the duality between these two approaches. In the third part, we will look at how to assess the quality of model fits, first by assessing parameter uncertainty by bootstrapping, and then by comparing models. So why do we fit models, and what are linear models? Let's start with a simple example. Assume that you have some data where a visual stimulus, that is some image on a screen, has been shown to an animal, and we've recorded spike counts of a neuron in some visual area in the brain. For each repetition of the stimulus, as shown by one dot each, we have varied its contrast, and that's shown on the horizontal axis. This results in a change of the measured spike count, and that is shown on the vertical axis. Let's start with a simple model in which we assume that the spike count on average increases linearly with contrast. We express this with a simple equation with two parameters. The intercept theta zero models the spike count at zero contrast, and the slope theta one models how the spike count increases with contrast. Different values for these parameters correspond to different assumed relationships between contrast and spike count, as you can see on the left. The question is then, what is the best set of parameters to describe this relationship? To address this question, we need to define what best means, or how we would measure goodness of fit. Once we have this definition, we can in turn ask how we find these best fitting parameters, which are the ones that maximize our goodness of fit. So once we have find, found these parameters, what can we do with them? First, we could validate our model fit by using it to generate new data. And uh, as you can see here by the purple dots on the left, and ask how well they match the data we've used to fit the model. Second, we can look at the new data sets that the model hasn't seen before, as shown here in orange, and ask how well the model is able to explain it. We could do that by, for example, asking how far these orange dots are away from the gray line. Another thing we can do is to predict the model's behavior outside of the measured data. Here, for example, by predicting spike counts for contrasts higher than the ones we measured as shown by the green dots. Furthermore, we can interpret the model parameters by, for example, asking if the intercept is significantly different from zero. In other words, we could ask if this intercept is actually required, or if a model with a zero intercept, here shown by a gray dashed line, would work equally well. Last but not least, we can compare different model fits by, for example, asking if the relationship between contrast and spike counts is better captured by a line or by a quadratic relationship, as shown here in purple. So as you can see, a lot can be done once we've fitted our models. Let's now look at one particular type of model that will be the main focus of today. These models, which are known as linear models, are probably the single most useful class of models you will see in this course. We've already looked at a very simple instance, the line describing the relationship between contrast and spike count, but they can be significantly more complex. To see this, let us assume that our images and stimulus have multiple features, for example, contrast, orientation, and so on, and assume that each of these features now is an input to our model here denoted by a vector of x's, x1, x2, and so on. A still simple linear model would then ask how to scale each of these inputs to determine the variable of interest y. 
This leads to this linear equation, y equals theta 0 plus theta 1 times x1 plus theta 2 times x2, and so on. For two inputs, this forms a plane in the xy space with the three parameters theta 0, theta 1, and theta 2. For more inputs, it will become a higher dimensional hyperplane. Linear models can be even more general than this by taking nonlinear functions of the inputs. For example, we could take the square of x2 and the fourth order of x, uh, sorry, we could take the square of x1 in this case and the fourth order of x2 and still have a linear model as it remains linear in the parameters theta 0, theta 1, and so on, even though the function it now describes is nonlinear in the space of inputs, as you can see here. More generally, a linear model is one that sums up a set of nonlinear functions of the inputs, the phi i's, each weighted by the corresponding parameter theta i. In vector form, this can be written as an inner product, as shown here. Note that I've added a 1 to the phi vector, which ensures that you have an input-independent offset included in the model. That's the theta, uh, th sorry, theta 0 in the other two equations um, that you've seen above. When you use built-in functions to fit these models, some automatically include this one and others don't. That's something to be careful about. Overall, linear models are models that are linear in its parameters, but don't need to be linear in the inputs. This feature makes them a very powerful and useful class of models that you will see over and over again in this course. This completes part one of the introduction. I'll see you back for part two. Welcome back to part two of the introduction to day three. In this part, we will ask how to fit models, that is, how to find the best fitting parameters. In general, there are two philosophies for fitting models. The first is to interpret the model as some function f with some parameters theta, and we want to find the model that has the smallest error. The second philosophy is to interpret them as generators of our data. And for this, we assume that they are again described by some function f plus some noise, where the noise is drawn from some distribution. Such a model then fully specifies the process by which the data is made, and we want to find the model that assigns the highest probability to some observed data set. As we will see, the second philosophy allows for a much richer set of statements. Let us now start with the first philosophy of fitting models by minimizing errors. To do so, let's return to the previous example where we want to model the relationship between contrast and spike counts with a simple line. To find the best line, we will measure the error by the mean squared error, which is probably the most popular error measure to use. The mean squared error is based on computing the distance for each data point to its associated model prediction, squaring this distance, as shown here by the blue shaded error function, and then averaging the squared distance across all data points. This leads to the expression on the right. We can then find the best fitting parameters as the ones that minimize the mean squared error, as shown at the bottom. The mean squared error is not exactly the same, but it's related to this R squared measure you've used in day two. To introduce the second philosophy of model fitting, we need to take a generative perspective. This perspective assumes that the model is the thing that generated the observed data. In our example on the left, our model would be this gray line, and the data would be a noisy version of that line. So the data is the model prediction plus some noise. The noise reflects two components. The first component is everything we can't control, such as, for example, measurement noise, that we just need to accept this given. The second component represents everything we don't care about. For example, we might only be interested in modeling the average spike counts per contrast, such that the additional stochasticity inherited to spike generation is not part of the model prediction itself and goes into the noise term. Both, combination, uh, both components in combination determine the distribution of our noise term. And once we have specified this distribution, what we get is the likelihood function. This likelihood function is a probability distribution of our data given our parameters and allows us to ask questions like, how likely is the data for a given set of parameters? What's important here is, is that this is a probability distribution over the data, but not over parameters, because it does not sum to one across all possible parameter values. As we're interested in the likelihood function as a function of these parameters, we make this more explicit by writing it as a function L of our parameters given the data. And once we have this function, how do we actually find the best fitting parameters? So for this, we'll move to the principle of maximum likelihood. This principle tells us that the best parameters are the ones that make the data most likely. In other words, they are the parameters that maximize our likelihood, as shown by this particular expression here. 
As we've just seen, likelihoods relate to probabilities, which means that they usually take on very small values. A small values might result in numerical issues. Instead of maximizing the likelihood itself, usually what we do is, we, is to maximize the log likelihood instead, which is numerically more stable. The reason this works is because the log is monotonically increasing, such that the parameters that maximize the likelihood will be the same as the ones that maximize the log likelihood. Another thing that I'd like to mention in this context is that frequently we deal with data that can be assumed to be statistically independent across trials. This implies that the likelihood across a number of trials can be written as a product of the likelihoods per trial as shown here. As a consequence, the maximum likelihood parameters are the ones that maximize the product of the per trial likelihoods, which, as we've seen above, is the same as maximizing the sum of the per trial log likelihoods. This will be something that will become handy once you start formulating your own models and the associated log likelihoods. Let's now look at one particular type of model that assumes that the noise is Gaussian with a constant variance across all data points. That means that for each trial, the probability of the variable of interest given the parameters, which is the likelihood of the parameters given the data, is given by this normal distribution, which has a mean that's centered on the model prediction f and has a variance of sigma squared, as illustrated by this distribution here. What does this mean for fitting the models by maximum likelihood? Well, first, we'll again assume that the data is statistically independent across trials, such that the log likelihood across trials is the sum of the per trial log likelihoods. We can then take our expression for the likelihood above, take the log, and what we get is the sum of squared differences between the variable of interest and the model prediction scaled by some prefactor, plus an additional set of terms that are independent of the parameters and therefore irrelevant for maximizing the likelihood. As it turns out, the sum is the same as the mean squared error we've seen before, and that shows us that maximizing the likelihood while assuming Gaussian noise is due to this minus here, equivalent to minimizing the mean squared error. What we've encountered here is a particular example of a general duality between maximizing likelihoods and minimizing errors. In general, maximizing likelihoods can always be interpreted as minimizing some error function, where the way that that error is measured depends on the assumptions we make about the form of the noise and the likelihood. For Gaussian noise, as we've assumed here, this error becomes the squared error. One thing to keep in mind when assuming Gaussian noise is that it makes the model fit sensitive to outliers. Making the data most likely under the assumption of Gaussian noise, as illustrated here, is the same as minimizing the squared error difference between each of the data points and the model predictions. As we measure the error by the squared of the distance, data points further away from the model predictions more strongly influence the fits. This means that if we have a data point that's particularly different from the other ones, and that's known as an outlier shown here in red, it will strongly influence the model fits. And you can see this by comparing the resulting model as shown in red with the one that we would get without the outlier as shown in gray. This is something to be kept in mind when you're fitting models in the Sun Gaussian noise, or equivalently if you measure the error by the squared error. All we've heard so far applies to models in general, but let's now have a look at linear models specifically. As we've heard in the first part of the introduction, linear models assume that the model predictions are given by a linear combination of the parameters and some potentially nonlinear function of the inputs given some uh, plus some noise. If we again assume Gaussian noise that is independent across trials, then the log likelihood will again be proportional to the negative sum of squared model prediction errors, where we've now plugged in the particular form of the predictions for the linear model. This gives us a few interesting properties. The first is that this is probably the single most important statistical model that you will see in this course, so it's really important that you understand it. A second property is that the likelihood is quadratic in the parameters theta, which means that it is a concave function of these parameters. The consequence of this is that it makes it very easy to find the best fitting parameters, and that's a very beneficial uh, feature of linear models, which makes them frequently more preferable to nonlinear ones. Moreover, rather than having to evaluate the log likelihood for multiple different parameter values to find its maximum, there actually exists an analytical expression for this maximum that we can directly compute from the data, and that's something you will see in the tutorials. All of these properties make linear models particularly appealing and therefore also very popular. So let's recap what we've learned in this part. First, there are two philosophies for fitting models. One is to minimize model error, and the second is to maximize the likelihood. As it turns out, there is a duality between these two approaches that we've encountered in the context of minimizing squared error, 
which in turn turns out to be the same as maximizing the likelihood while assuming that the noise is Gaussian. For this fairly standard assumption, I also gave a word of caution, namely that it makes the model fit sensitive to outliers. Applying these approaches to linear models turns out to give, give us a few favorable properties. In particular, for linear models, it's very easy to find the best fitting parameters because the log likelihood is concave in these parameters, and we have an expression that allows us to compute these best fitting parameters directly from the data. This concludes the second part of my introduction. I'll see you back for the third part. Welcome back to part three of the introduction, where we'll learn about how to assess the quality of our model fits. Let's assume we found some best fitting parameters, and we want to know how certain we can be about the specific found parameter values. The reason why we might be uncertain about these parameter values is that we usually deal with limited data. And the consequence of this is that multiple parameter values might explain the data about equally well, which is a reflection of the inherent uncertainty about the best fitting parameters. So why would you care about this uncertainty? Well, on one hand, it'll tell us how well the data constrains our model fits and helps us to decide how much emphasis we should put on specific parameter values we found. On the other hand, it allows us to decide if particular parameters are significantly different from zero. To see why this is useful, let's go back to our previous example where we've tried to model the relationship between contrast and spike counts. If we model this by a line as before, then we have two parameters, the intercept theta zero and the slope theta one. Once we found the best fitting parameter values, we can ask how certain we are that the intercept is actually different from zero. In other words, does a model with zero intercept, as shown here by the dashed line, fit our data about equally well? If that's the case, then we could, rid, could get rid of this particular model component. One way to assess the parameter uncertainty is by means of standard statistical methods. Those, however, work in most cases only for linear models, which is why we won't discuss them further here. Instead, we'll look at a more general approach to assess parameter uncertainty that also works for nonlinear models and is known as bootstrapping. To assess our parameter uncertainty by bootstrap, we will take our original data set, here given by 50 trials, and resample this data by, replacing it, uh, by replacement uh, to get another 50 trials. When doing so, we would sample some trials multiple times, as shown here in black, and others not at all, as shown here in gray. We can then go ahead and again fit our line to get an intercept and a slope, as shown on the right. Repeating this resampling and performing another fit gives us another line and another set of associated parameters, as also shown here. If we do this many, many times, I've done this here 10,000 times in this example, we'll get a whole range of model fits and associated parameters, here shown by a histogram over all the parameter values. The histogram, in turn, provides us with an assessment for how uncertain, how uncertain we are about these parameter values. As we can see here, the histogram is narrower for the intercept than the slope, meaning that we're more certain about the intercept's value. We can now go ahead and also ask if we need this intercept or if we could set it to zero to get an equally good fit. To do so, we look at the interval with, uh, within which 95% of the bootstrap samples fall, which gives us the 95% confidence interval. We can see that this interval does not contain zero, which means that despite our uncertainty in the expect, exact parameter values, we can be confident that uh, it is significantly different from zero. So in this example, we would conclude that a non-zero intercept is a required component to model the observed data. Another way to assess the quality of model fits is by comparing them across different models. So far, we focused on using a line to fit the relationship between contrast and spike counts, but as you might see, for particular low and high contrasts, many of these data points actually come to lie above the line. So could it be that a quadratic fit, which is shown here by the purple line, might give us a better description of this relationship? Well, indeed, if we measure the quality of the fits by the mean squared error, as shown here on the right, you can see that this error decreases if we move from a line to a second order polynomial, which is our quadratic fit. What would happen if we use an even more complex model, let's say a fifth order polynomial? In this case, you can see that the error decreases even further. In fact, if we continue this for higher order polynomials, we can see that the mean squared error consistently decreases with an increase in the polynomial order. This means that if we were to take the mean squared error as a measure of the quality of our fits, we were to conclude that the higher the polynomial order, the better the fit. <laughs> 
However, as you can already see by looking at the model fits of the fifth order polynomial on the left, it doesn't actually provide us with a very good model. In particular, it would predict that for higher contrast, the spike counts should decrease. And that's not something we would expect to see in the real data. We can see a further indicator of this by asking how well the fitted model can explain new data that, have, that the models haven't seen yet, as shown here in orange. If we measure the mean squared error for this new data, we can see that this error initially decreases if we move from a line to a quadratic function. That means that it captures more of the structure underlying the data. However, once we move to higher order polynomials, the error starts to increase, which means that the more complex the model, the more it starts to capture the specifics of the data used for model fitting without capturing more of the underlying structure of the data. These two lines that you can see here actually have a name. The bottom one, which measures the mean squared error of the data that has been used to fit the model is known as the training set error. And the top one, which is the error on the holdouts data is known as the test set error. In this example, the best model would be the second order polynomial because it manages to capture most of the data structure without over-specializing to specifics of the data used to fit the model. What we've seen in this example is a reflection of a more general principle known as the bias variance trade-off. This trade-off decomposes the model error into two components and describes how their contribution changes with varying model complexity. In our previous example, model complexity was controlled by polynomial order with higher orders representing more complex models. In this example, the line which is the least complex model, was not able to capture all of the structure in our data and as a result introduced a lot of bias that caused systematic deviations from that structure. In other words, it was underfitting our data. Models of higher complexity in contrast will be able to capture that structure and therefore will reduce that bias. The downside that comes with increasing model complexity is that the models will start to capture variability beyond the structure of the data. That's known as variance. In other words, they might start capturing noise and therefore overfits the data. This is why the variance component of the model error increases for increasing model complexity. The total model error is a combination of both the bias and the variance of each model. And the best model is the one that balances bias and variance. What exactly the best model is depends on both your data and all the models that you're actually considering. One way to find a good model is to fit multiple of them and then compare them to each other. That's a procedure known as model comparison. As for model fitting, there are also two philosophies for model comparison. The first one is to compare them by the goodness of fit. And that's a very popular method in statistics and also the most common method used in neuroscience. This method is based on computing the likelihood of the fitted model and then correct for the number of parameters used as a proxy for the model complexity uh, and that results in a measure of the goodness of fit. And the idea here is that a good model is a model that uses few parameters to produce good fits. And that's also the method you've seen used in day two. The second philosophy is to use cross-validation, which is very popular in machine learning, but less used in neuroscience. The idea of cross-validation is one you've already seen in the previous example, and is based on fitting the model to some data, and then check how well it predicts a new data set that hasn't been used to fit the model. To go into more detail of either of these approaches, let's first start with an example of the first approach corresponding to model comparison by goodness of fit. A popular approach for doing so is to use the Akeike information criterion, which is measured on one hand by the negative log likelihood of the best fitting parameters, here given by the second term. On the other hand, it penalizes model complexity by the first term, which adds twice the number of model parameters to this negative log likelihood. If we apply this criterion to our previous example with an increasing polynomial order of our models, we can see that it again picks out the quadratic function as the best model because it best explains our data while keeping the model parameters low. An advantage of this criterion is that it is easy to compute because you just need to evaluate the given expression. The disadvantage is that it makes fairly strong assumptions about the model structure and that it's not applicable uh, to all the models that we might actually be interested in. The ARC is only one possible goodness of fish measure, which you can use to compare models. The other information criteria like the BRC, DRC, and so on, and the way that they differ is by how they measure model complexity. There's also Bayesian model comparison. The BRC is actually an approximation thereof. And Bayesian model comparison compares models 
by implicitly penalizing model complexity by computing the goodness of fit by averaging the model across a wide range of possible parameter values. Other goodness of fit measures exist, but we won't go into them in this introduction. So lastly, let's look at the second philosophy of model comparison, which is model comparison by cross-validation. The underlying idea is to compare models by how well they are able to predict the data that hasn't been used to fit the model. As we've seen in the previous example, this implicitly penalizes overly complex models, as those start to fit noise in the data used to fit the models, shown here by decreasing training set error. This in turn leads to worse predictions on the data that hasn't been used for these fits, and that's shown here by a mostly increasing test set error. Cross-validation has lots of advantages, the biggest probably being that it makes little assumptions about the data, which makes it very widely applicable. It also has a few disadvantages, as for example, the requirement for lots of data to split into a training and a test set, the need to refit the model multiple times, which is associated with higher computational cost, as well as less sensitivity to small model differences, unlike some other measures. You'll see more details of cross-validation in, uh, in today's tutorial. So, what have we learned in the last part of the introduction? Well, first, because we're fitting models to limited data, it makes the model parameters uncertain. One way to assess this uncertainty is by bootstrapping, which provides us with a measure of the uncertainty for each of the parameter values, as well as allowing us to compute confidence intervals and perform statistical tests on these parameter values. Lastly, we've looked at two philosophies for comparing models, the goodness of fit measure and cross-validation. You'll see more examples of all of this in today's tutorial, which I hope you enjoy, and I wish you the best of luck.